So I often think about all the people I have been with who have died. And this actually settles my mind. Because all living beings know how to die. We've all died innumerable times. When I worked on an oncology unit in a hospital, there were often four to six deaths a week. A lot of death. Most of the patients I talked with told me the hardest part of their illness was that their loved ones didn't want to talk about their impending death. And so they ended up taking care of their loved ones and felt quite isolated in their experience. This points to the habit that we have of ignoring impermanence and death. Even people I cared for who were very angry at getting cancer as they came closer to death time, they were able to accept what was happening and their transition was peaceful. That's one of the reasons I think it is said that death is the great equalizer. What I learned in talking with and caring for dying patients is that they were very aware that they were dying. And the work was to accept it. I was reminded of this recently when I read about Walter Mondale's death. He was a vice president to uh, President Jimmy Carter and his foremost contribution to the vice presidency was reshaping the position from a primarily ceremonial role into a position of influence. And he also saw having a woman as vice president as part of how that team should change. So he picked Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate in 1984, the first American woman on the major party ticket. So he did a lot for this country, actually, a lot for women. He died on April 19th at the age of 93. On April 17th, two days before he died, he wrote a farewell email to many staff members. He wrote, Dear team, while my time has come, I am eager to rejoin Joan and Eleanor. That was his wife and daughter. Before I go, I wanted to let you know how much you mean to me. Never has a public servant had a better group of people working at their side. Together we have accomplished so much, and I know you will keep up the good fight. My best to all of you. Fritz that was his nickname. So here's a man at 73 years of age who is focused two days before his death on thanking those he had worked with. I think this is a good example of the common experience of knowing that you, when you are dying and then the choices that we have where we put our attention. Clearly, he had accepted that he was dying. Also now at 93, Walter Mondale more and likely did not have a comfortable and pain-free body. Yet he accepted he was close to death and he chose to use his remaining energy to thank those who served him in his career. Seems to me if Walter Mondale can live and die in this peaceful, beautiful manner, so can we as Buddhist practitioners. As Ven Venerable Sangi Kadro taught in the recent retreat on peaceful living, peaceful dying, the Buddha taught a lot about how to work with pain and death in the Samutta Nikaya Sutra. So here's a little bit of that story. The Buddha was answering a question of a very old disciple who said, Blessed one, I am feeble from old age. I am weak and suffer from disease. Yet with my own strength, I make the effort to meet the blessed one and the senior and esteemed monastics who are my good friends. May the blessed one give me a teaching so that it will be for my peace for a long time. At that time, the blessed one said to the householder, Nakula, it is well, householder, you are really ripe with age, weak and suffering from disease, yet you are able with your own strength to, to, to meet the Tathagata and the other senior and esteemed monastics who are your good friends. Householder, you should know, when the body is suffering from disease, you should constantly train so that the mind does not suffer from disease. Now, can we believe that the mind does not need to suffer from disease when the body is? 
I think most people believe that pain with the disease is going to be unbearable, and then unbearable death follows. Well, this is not my experience in caring for the dying, nor it is, is it my experience in dealing with the day-to-day -day pains that we all experience. So the Buddha taught many methods for working with pain and death, practicing using the four establishments of mindfulness, that's body, feelings, mind, and phenomena. Very helpful. And the reason these four are practiced is to stop grasping. So we're counteracting the grasping the body to be the basis of identity, the basis of self. Grasping the feelings to be the objects experienced by the self. Grasping the mind to be the actual self. Grasping at phenomena like attachment as afflicting the self. So today I thought to talk a little bit about feeling the second of the four establishments of mindfulness. Feeling is the second of the five aggregates and is relevant to learning how to avoid bodily pain affecting the mind. A simile of being shot by one or two arrows is often used in the teachings. The discourse in the Sumata Nikaya illustrates the situation of one whose mind suffers along with bodily pain with the example of a person who is shot by two arrows. In contrast, remaining unshaken by bodily pain is comparable to being shot by only one arrow. This pain is something we all can calmly be with if we train our minds. The additional arrow can be avoided by cultivating a proper understanding of feelings. So crucial here is the understanding that just as they arise, so they cease. This helps to counter a natural tendency of the mind to perceive feelings, in particular painful feelings at a time of sickness, as if they were solid and never-ending. So think about it. The last time that you were sick and you had some pain, what was your mind's reaction? Was it that, huh? This is never going to go away. I'm going to die with this. You know, that's what we do. So feelings are a changing process. We have to train ourselves to remember this now, each day. Every time we react to pain with irritation, with non-acceptance, this activates that underlying tendency to aversion in the mind. The more this underlying tendency is activated, the stronger it becomes. And therefore, the more readily a future arising of aversion will be triggered. And this is not accepting what is happening at the moment. However, every single time we don't react to pain, this weakens the underlying habit of aversion. And we're training ourselves to accept the sensations. We then start to disconnect pain from mind suffering. Another interesting reaction of aversion to pain is to pursue attachment to counter our mind pain. We're conditioned to seek an alternative to pain by indulging in some kind of sense pleasure. When ill, we often distract from pain with some form of sense enjoyment. Of course, the trouble with this strategy is that it does not solve the problem and instead leads to activating and strengthening of the underlying tendency to all the usual sense attachments. The more we cling to pleasant feelings, the more we will be affected by their changing nature, especially when this change is a return to the experience of pain. So we're getting a very momentary relief at the cost of long-term mind pain. The net result of resorting to any kind of sense distraction when in pain is a vicious circle of being ever more subject to unwise reactions to feelings and activating of the underlying tendencies of aversion and attachment. So it becomes quite a merry-go-round. Even when feelings are neutral, this manifests in the desire for some sort of diversion from what feels like a boring experience. So check your mind about that one, you know, when things are kind of neutral. Oh, we label that boring. And then we have to go do something. So by remembering that feelings are just changing sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, then this experience and this remembrance can be a very powerful source of understanding 
and so much less suffering if we can remember this, if we can practice, train our minds to think in this way. All it takes is to remain aware in the present moment of the changing process of feelings as they are without reacting. Regarding the simile of the two arrows, the idea is not that we should just endure any pain without doing anything about it at all. Instead, we properly take care of what has led to the first arrow with whatever reasonable and appropriate medical means we have. And alongside that, we train the mind in such a way as to void the second arrow. Doing this while living, we can have a very interesting and easeful death. 